on the other hand, let me take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Ashok Kumar, Assistant Professor, Department of Mathematics, IIT Paraka, who will present his view on the topic probability and statistical tools for data science. Dr. Ashok Kumar received his bachelor's and master's degree in mathematics from Manonmanian Sudharan University, Tirunelveli. He had his PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Padu. On behalf of RSET and CTAR, I welcome you, sir, for this session. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. So, hope you can hear me. So, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ramkumar and uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me to give the talk here. So, this is actually this talk uh, is on actually some probability and statistical tools. So, uh, this is uh, a joint work. So some of the things are very, you know, very uh, basic. So I always feel that, you know, so in these conferences, you know, uh, instead of you know having some advanced things, you know, even in some basic thing, you know, we we uh, we have lot to learn. Okay, so that is my uh, that is what my understanding is. So I thought, uh, you know. Uh, even in some of the basic tools that we learn, so there are a lot more understanding is needed. So, uh, so I do not uh, want to cover uh, whatever I have here. So I wanted the uh, you know session to be interactive so that at least uh, some of these things are you know beneficial. Okay. So please feel free to stop me. No, so that is why I always want uh, this also to be in offline. Okay, so I am not in a hurry to cover everything, but if I am, you know, making uh, a few some things from this, uh, I will be happy. Okay, so this is uh, some ongoing work actually. Some some of the things are ongoing ongoing work with my uh, master's student, master's student at least. So there may be few. My mistakes here and there because this knowledge communicated in the Okay, so I will start with some very basic, uh, you know, traditional probability and uh, Bayes uh, rule. So, hope, uh, so how many of you uh, know these? You know, because I don't have, you know, so for example, in our IIT, you know, so faculty will be too. Uh, specialized content and uh, you know, so of the uh, algebraic topology. Uh, and also, they may not, uh, not very much, but uh, you know, so you know, they may have learned some time, but they may not very much. So, that is why I just uh, ask uh, how many of you, are, how many of you recall these days for number? Okay, so I will just, uh, you know, this, uh, there is, uh, so what I want to emphasize here is that even in, uh, so we know this base formula, right? So this is uh, probability of E given F is, uh, can be computer using you know, probability of F given E. 
that is one particular uh, and you know interpretation okay but uh, here also you know uh, some deep uh, understanding is uh, needed sometimes so i will show that with an example so the same we know that the same formula uh, becomes uh, like this right so when you have a um, you know partition of uh, your sample space then uh, this uh, probability of ei given f can be given by this formula but uh, what is more important is you know how do we interpret this okay. so that um, that that sometimes you know we may miss so how do we interpret this probability of ei given f So one interpretation, possible interpretation, is that you know, so this EI is only a partition of our sample space. Okay. So they are like various hypotheses about the population. Okay, various hypotheses about the population. This EIs. So P of EI is like the initial belief okay, about uh, these various hypotheses. So this probability of P1, probability of P2. Etc. They are all the initial beliefs about the uh, about the various hypothesis of the population. Now this can be so. Now this YAF is like a new information. Some new information you are getting. Okay. So then this uh, this particular number P of EI given YAF can be interpreted as your update in probabilities after getting this new information here. So that is uh, in, in that sense, you know, we may easily remember this. Okay, so these are all updates. So P of E1, E1, here. What is P of E2, E1, here? Okay, these are all updates on these EIs after getting this new information. Yeah. Okay, I will uh, show you with an example. Okay. So why one should be very careful? When we deal with uh, you know uh, conditional probability and phase formula, so for example, so uh, for example, I am giving uh, one example. This is a textbook uh, example, actually textbook problem, an undergraduate. But we may not really uh, realize uh, some. Uh, you know some uh, serious thing here okay so suppose we we say that let us say that there is a test say something like after pcr test for covid suppose that is known to be 95 percent accurate okay and uh, suppose uh, the person goes for the test and test positive okay. and um, so uh, having known that what is the probability that the person uh, will really have the uh, will really have COVID. So, what is our understanding with this information? That is, the test is 95% accurate. Okay, the, the person test positive. So, so, what is our understanding? What is the you know, what, how much is the chance that the person will indeed have the disease? Approximately, will it be high or low? The test is 95% accurate. The person test positive. Okay. So I'm not asking exact number. How you know confident you can say that the person will have. Uh, the will actually have a disease. The chances are high or lower or medium. Huh? So, huh? High, right? Okay, naturally, we, we think that the person will have will have a high chance of having the disease. So, this is this is very natural, but this is where you know, so one needs to be very careful. Okay, 
So actually, what is given? The given thing is that 95% uh, of the time it is accurate. Okay, so if we convert these into mathematical language, okay. So then what is given is this that the person uh, given that the person has COVID, the test will say it is positive is 95 percent. That is a mean. If if the person really has COVID, okay, then uh, what is the probability that the test will say if it is positive, it is 0.95. Okay, and uh, given that the, the person actually doesn't have the disease, so it will say negative, that is also 0.95, that is the interpretation, right? Now, what we actually need to find is, this one, this probability, right? So the test, the person test positive. So having known that the person test positive, what is the probability that the person indeed has COVID? Okay. So actually, this is what we need to find. So this is where we, uh, this is where we confuse. Actually, there is, uh, you know, we jump to conclusion. Okay, but. But what we we are not actually finding, you know, probability of uh, testing positive or negative. Okay, so we are actually this is like uh, this is what I said probability of EI given F. Okay, so what is without this conditioning? What is the probability? P of C. What is P of C? Probability of that for person having COVID is actually 2% only. Okay, because the, in the population, 2% of the people suffer from the disease. So the actual probability is 0 0.02. Okay, 0 0.02. Now that 0 0.02 is, get, is going to get updated. Okay, so. Uh, that is why actually, so yeah, now we got the information that the person uh, was tested positive. What is the probability that the person has to be, you know, COVID, right? So actually, if you calculate, the probability is about 28% only. Okay. So. Uh, so this is uh, just uh, what I'm saying is in one aspect, if you see, this is not surprising because the original probability was just 0 0.021 because only 2% of the population suffer from the disease. Okay, so in that sense, it is not surprising. But actually, in our, you know, uh, just uh, from your peripheral thought, it was surprising, it is surprising, right? Because 95% of the time that is you know, uh, predicts accurately. So the person tests positive, so it is more likely that the person has the disease. Okay. But actually, so this is this is just an example that why one should be very careful when making inferences. Okay. Yeah, so this is just a um, you know, basic thing. So similarly, there is oh, So there is a, a bird, something called a bird day problem. So in the same way, um, so there is, I, I will not spend too much time on this because these are all very, you know, uh, very simple ones, but uh, many of us may not uh, know. Okay, so how many of you know this bird day problem? There is something called a bird day problem. Okay. So now suppose uh, there are 20 people of you. Only in a hall, there are 20 people. What is the probability that at least two of you share a birthday? What is the chance that at least two of you have the same birthday? Okay, this is the problem. Okay, so because uh, so if I have to say 100% sure, assuming that an uh, uh, a year has. 365 days. Oh. Okay. 
Yeah, assuming that uh, a year has these 65 days, and uh, also assuming that you know every one of you have equally likely to have any one of these days as birthdays. So to be hundred percent sure that at least two of you have the same birthday, how many people should be there in the hall? Huh? Three sixty six. If there are three sixty six people, then I can hundred percent sure. I can be hundred percent sure that at least two of you have definitely same birthday. Right? Three sixty six people are needed. But actually, that is the beauty of that is why it was once called a birthday paradox. Why? Because so probably at least two people sharing a birthday in a group of so this is a simple you know school uh, probability calculation problem. So you can use that to calculate the probability actually. So this is the actual probability. So the thing is, if you calculate this for n is equal to forty, it is ninety uh, percent. Okay. So if we want to be sure, hundred percent sure. We need 366 people, but just 40 people are sufficient. So nine, there will be 90 for 90 percent chance that at least two of you will share your body. And uh, if it is a, a 70, then the probability is 99.9. We most sure that two of them are going to share your body. Okay, so this is why it was actually once called a birthday paradox. Okay, so then it was uh, it was all actually this is called the birthday problem. So this is also something I know in probability quite so all these examples I'm seeing you know, in probability calculations because when uh, people do this data analysis also you know most of the time they do this Bayesian uh, techniques etc. So so the and the Bayesian technique uh, for Bayesian statistics you know, or Bayesian data analysis. Uh, the key uh, key concept is this base rule, right? So uh, it is important to interpret that uh, properly so that the inferences are made not really. So, so that is the only thing. Now I am moving to some somewhat uh, advanced stuff. So there is something uh, called uh, law of large numbers. Right? Have you heard of it? So the law of large number says that suppose there is a population, right? So you have n samples. You have n samples from the population. Then uh, the law of large numbers, in simple terms, say that uh, provided uh, you know it has finite variance, etc. This sample, this is actually sample mean. Okay, so this is sample mean, sample mean. But you are just to population. So as uh, n becomes larger. So this is intuitively, it is clear, right? So sample is a subset of the population. And uh, you take a sample and uh, calculate the sample mean. So as the sample size increases, eventually you are going to get uh, all the pop, you know, all the population. So and this is a mathematical uh, uh, expressing that. So, for example, how does this uh, translate to uh, you know this? Uh, okay, so for example, if you take the population to be a Bernoulli population, Bernoulli population is just the zeros and ones, right? Zeros and ones. So your data is going to be full of zeros and ones. And um, so essentially, this law of large numbers. So this I'm just saying a simple way to understand this law of large numbers. What it is saying is that so you have a coin. Right? Suppose you have a coin. So the coin may have some some bias, right? So probably a pen may be something. If it is unbiased, the half, right? Otherwise, some p. Then probably a pain will be one minus p, right? 
So the speed we do not know. For a coin, we do not know what is the speed. Like only hard only knows. See what is the uh, design, you know, whether it is unbiased or a bias, with bias speed, right? So this uh, result is essentially saying that if you want to know the speed, we just have to because in the Bernoulli thing, if you see this, what is this going to be? This sample mean. In the Bernoulli case, these xi's are going to be zeros or ones, right? So this, this sum, what is this sum? What is this sum going to give you? Suppose I I I denote the head by one, tail by zero. Okay, head by one, tail by zero. Then what is this sum? X1 is 0 or 1, X2 is 0 or 1. That's why Xn is also 0 or 1. So this sum is actually what? The sum is huh? number of ones, right? Is going to be 0 plus 1, you know, plus 1 plus 0, something like that. So when you sum, the zeros are not going to contribute anything, only the ones are going to contribute. So the sum is nothing but number of ones or number of x divided by what? Divided by total number of classes. Right? Total number of classes. So then what is this? This object? This this uh, this object, this sample mean is nothing but right proportional x. Okay, so and uh, so this the, what does this result say is actually proportional of x converges to mu. What is mu in this case for Bernoulli? Mu is expected value, right? The expected value is 1 into p, xi p again, right? So 1 into p plus 0 into 1 minus p. So what is the expected value? P. So the mu is p. So for the Bernoulli case, this is saying that the proportion of x converges to probability of x. This mu is going to be p. What is P? P is actually probability of head. So the moral of the story is that the last large numbers, otherwise, you know, in um, the you know, we use this uh, very big job as a long large numbers. But the, the message that I would like to say is that so to understand all these uh, theorems, of if you just take a point cost, you can understand the result. Very, very, uh, very simple terms. Okay. So, yeah. So, this is what I wanted to get. Okay. 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 Now, next another. This is something. So, these are all something that I came to know over the period of time. Actually, when I learned Cedricius in Bali once upon a time during my master. Okay, so I learned it as an inequality. So it's probably you know, something greater than or equal to something greater than or equal to something. Okay, so what is this useful part? Why do we learn this? Right? So this is actually saying something, some very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Okay. So it is saying, actually, this is the, this is the result in uh, uh, probability term. But to understand this probability uh, result, you actually what we need to do is we need to go to statistics to understand its beauty. Okay, we have to look at this result. 
from a statistical point of view. So from a statistical point of view, so what does this say? Actually, in probability terms also, what is it saying is that x is a random variable. Mu is its mean. Okay, x is a random like x is like 0 or 1. Mu is that uh, true b. Okay, so that distance less than or equal to k sigma, k times standard deviation. Okay, so this is like uh, x is a random thing that is within k standard deviations from the mean. Okay, what is the probability of that? That is at least 1 minus 1 by k square. Whatever number of standard deviations you say, it depends on that. So, for example, this is the analogous result in statistics. So, what it is saying is that this probability is after all proportion, right? Probability is like fraction or proportion or percentage, right? So, what is what it is saying is that here is your x bar. Okay. In in in, uh, in statistics, this mu becomes x bar, right? So this is uh, mean k standard deviations away from mean. So x bar minus k sx. So standard deviation, sx is standard deviation. x bar minus k sx. This is x bar plus k sx. How many, how many, uh, how many data, data samples? Okay. So I just hope I can use the hand, right? So how many data among the, the n data samples, how many fall in this that is at least one minus one by three? Okay, so that is see, this is what we you know you would like to know, right? So suppose you have to some data, some random data. Okay, we know that the mean is a center of attraction, right? So most of the data are going to be around the mean. Okay, most of it again, right? Okay, it is not necessary that all the data has to be around the mean, okay, it can be far away also, but because x bar is x representative, uh, most of the data are going to be around x bar. So, we would be actually interested in knowing that what proportion of data are within standard deviation is a spread, right? So, within some k standard deviations away from the mean, so within this. Number, so, Chevishev inequality is actually giving a bound, okay, giving an estimate at least uh, this much. So, that is the beauty of this result. So, some of you, if you have not thought about it, so if you think about this, uh, it will be very, very interesting. Okay. So, now now this, uh, so now I am moving to yeah. So now I am moving to somewhat uh, you know uh, some some big computers that we did around these lines. So one of the problems is to estimate uh, number of samples, right? To, so for example, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, TPR, right? TPR in the case of COVID, right? So what is the TPR of these regions? Okay, what is our, what is the TPR for Kerala? What is the TPR for the computer for the right? Etc. So uh, this uh, TPR, so. We always actually naturally uh, the natural question is so they are okay, they are saying uh, the TPR is this much, this much, etc. But uh, we always okay how they tested sample, how many how many samples they are tested, right? So that was always a question, right? So for example, even these statistics inequality, etc., we can be cleverly used to estimate the number of samples required to predict uh, this uh, TPR, etc. to a certain uh, degree of accuracy. So that is what uh, so that is what we uh, did uh, a little. 
with the master's uh, student application. So, because see the, the data can be uh, even the COVID data can be classic, you know, uh, can be modeled by using the only analysis, right? Because if a person has COVID tested positive, one tested negative, zero. So it is a Bernoulli data. Okay, so finally, the data that we collect is just a uh, collection of zeros and ones. Okay, so it is uh, about to, so then the P, this P is actual key P. You need to estimate this P. This, the P is the unknown one that God only knows thing. That we are actually uh, estimating, trying to estimate this P. So, yeah, for example, this is same as you know, predicting or estimating this P is same as you know, predicting this PDR. Okay, so essentially, uh, so using these uh, efficiency inequality or Sharma. I will be talking about other inequalities also. So it is about um, uh, this. Okay. Uh, so this x bar, right? This x bar is the uh, what is that? The empirical TPM that we calculate. Okay, suppose there are 20 people, I guess all the 20 people, how many of them tested positive divided by 20? That is my Empirical TPR, right? That is this X bar. P is P is in God's hand. P is what we want to know, right? So, and I want to know with uh, some epsilon precision, right? So, Ralph Rajanabha says that you can't uh, you, you can't know what what God has unless we have unless n tends to infinity. Unless we have all the objects, you have to test everyone. That is your law, law, law of the So it is impossible to say with 100% sure. So that is what we saw in birthday problems. Okay, we can be sure about 99.9, you know, but never 100%. For 100%, you get 366. Okay, so that is the beauty of this. No, a probability and statistics. But for all practical purposes, 99.9 .9 is good enough, right? So if something is going to be true for 90% or 99%, etc., we are going to follow that, right? Okay. So do we do we have a case uh, like this after this hundred percent that will work hundred percent, right? So in, when it comes to practice, it is always uh, nothing is. So that is why we, we want to, I want to go close to God with the epsilon, that is, with the epsilon precision. Okay. How, how much confident? 1 minus alpha. So for example, alpha is 0 0.05, then how much confident we are? Any 5 percent. This is the kind of, now the, what is the problem? What is the n? I want to know the minimum n so that this is satisfied. Okay, that is so typically this epsilon is going to be 0 0.01, depending on how precisely you want. Definitely, the number of samples required is going to be larger and larger. When you want then you when you want to go close to that, right? Okay. So uh, Definitely there is a trade off. So with the epsilon, with one minus alpha confidence, I want to find the minimum n. Yeah. That is minimum number of samples need to be tested. Yeah, so this was uh, this is something uh, I know uh, that uh, he is directed, he plotted all those uh, you know. Uh, uh, how many, you know, what was the samples, number of samples uh, tested, and uh, what was the TPR? Okay. So, for example, uh, you know, on a particular day, uh, things may about a lakh uh, samples were tested. This is from the government data, and uh, the TPR was 32.3%. So, 
So essentially, we want to find that this is what I said. How many samples we need, we need to predict uh, PPR, and how confident uh, to predict a certain accuracy and uh, with certain confidence. So now I will show how Cherishes inequality can be cleverly used to predict this. So for example, Cherishes inequality is not that uh, efficient, actually. But uh, Cherishes inequality is very simple. Okay? Uh, still, uh, it can be used to get the initial estimates. Suppose you want to have some quick estimates, how many samples we need to test to this much uh, accuracy. So Cherishes inequality, but in practice, no one uses Cherishes inequality because it is uh, not a high bound. There are much better bounds available. But for the, for the sake of understanding, I will start with the Cherishes inequality because that is something that uh, all of us know, right? Then I will talk about other better inequality. Okay, so for example, we had a Cherishes inequality here, we had x minus mu, etc. Right? So, um, so now I can apply it because I want to apply Cherishes inequality for this x bar, right? X bar is the x bar is the uh, the sample sample mean, right? So I, I want to get an estimate on this, okay, on this p. This is uh, in the Bernoulli case. This is going to be p. This mu is going to be p. Okay. So uh, here k times standard deviation, right? So we have k times standard deviation. So here this is x bar, and the standard deviation of x bar is sigma by square root of. Okay. So the Cherishes inequality when applied to sample mean, this is a form it's, it takes. So here, but here I want, uh, you know, this is for k can be any positive uh, real number. Okay. So, but here, here I want what? Epsilon, right? That is what we were interested in. Here I want epsilon, here I want 1 minus alpha like two. Okay. So, so what uh, uh, k, I, I have to take k to be epsilon times plus one n by sigma. So that I will get this will become excellent. Right? So then, so if you take the k to be this, then you get this. Okay? So, um, so in the Bernoulli, so yeah, the same result now in the Bernoulli case, uh, this mu becomes p. So sigma for the Bernoulli, uh, for the Bernoulli distribution, sigma square is p into one minus p. So you get uh, this form. So the problem turns out this. Okay. So n has to be so because this right hand side has to be at least one minus alpha. Okay. The right hand side has to be one minus alpha. So n has to be greater than or equal to this p into one minus p by one by epsilon square. So from this we get to see the beauty of that thing. So if n is at least this much. We can predict the actual PPR into that uh, accuracy. Okay, so now the, the problem is here is uh, one problem. What is the problem? So this this result uh, cannot be used as of now. Why? Right? So we want to find the minimum n, right? In n in this result, say n is at n should be at least this much. Now this result cannot be used why? Why? Huh? Because it involves this P. The P and we don't know, right? If you know the P, then there is no problem, right? P is in God's hands. God only knows the actual PPM. Right? So we don't know that P. But what we know is that we know something about this quantity p into x into one minus x function. This is like x into one minus x function. What is the maximum value of that function? Okay, so the maximum value of that function is one four. Okay, maximum of x into one minus x is again that x into the power. 
the maximum value is 1 4. So you can take the maximum value given by if I take the worst case scenario. Okay, so I can go for the worst case scenario. Now I am seeing how this result can be used. So n should be at least this much. Okay, so now you know epsilon alpha, right? Epsilon how how accurate you want, and alpha is how confident you want to be. So those are given to you. You will be able to find n. N should be, for example, if you calculate, if you want to be 95 percent uh, confident and the accuracy is much, then n should be 50,000 samples. Okay, you need to test at least. So, but actually, you don't need to test 50,000 samples. Actually, okay, we will see. Okay, there are other better results that say that. Uh, but this result is not bad. Like, okay, you can be sure 50,000 samples, but that much, that many samples are not needed. Uh, so, this is because Chebyshev's inequality is not that the best bound, actually. Okay, but still, it has a lot of opinion. Okay, so now there is something called Chernoff form. How many of you have heard of Chernoff form? Yeah, those uh, you are working in machine learning. Okay. So Chernoff form is uh, very much used in uh, you know, machine learning diagnostics, etc. Because Chernoff form is actually an improvement in Chebyshev's uh, inequality. So if you look at the proof of Chernoff form, they will essentially use Chebyshev's inequality or Markov's inequality. You may have heard of Markov's inequality, right? So Markov's inequality is also almost like uh, actually Chebyshev's inequality uh, can be obtained from Markov's inequality also. So this is the, so you you get uh, this bounding exponential term. So you just have to apply uh, Markov's inequality in a proper way. Okay. So, so we can actually in the Bernoulli case using Chernoff bound we can get some bounds something like this. So so using uh, the same same idea if you use you can get a bound to something like this using the term of term of uh, inequality. Okay. So also I don't know whether you do. So this term of bound improves this actually. It says, for example, when alpha is this much, epsilon is this much, you need uh, only 30, uh, 37,067 samples. Needed to okay, to this um, to this result. and uh, for, there is something called word thing inequality, which is also very closely related to term of uh, inequality. Uh, that further improves. So the interesting thing is, if you see in uh, Chebyshev's inequality, this was not an exponential term, right? It was actually P into one minus P divided by n times epsilon squared. Okay, some kind of polynomial. So here we have the exponential bound. That is what uh, makes it uh, very interesting. Okay. So, so, for example, yeah. So there are. So similarly, for example, so in this project we looked at the with uh, all inequalities of uh, this nature. Okay, so we want to get the best result. Is a minimum sample actually they are all giving bombs, right? Okay, 50,000 samples are there, okay, no problem, but you may not need that many samples, right? So that is why there are, and finally, we have something called the uh, interval estimation that I will talk about. Okay, uh, the interval is among all these things, the interval estimation is something that I'm going to talk about. So we have so much time. Okay. You need to take a break. Okay, anyway. So uh, yeah, I will not uh,
in the thing. Okay, so the thing is, among all these things, interval estimation is something that uh, that gives us the uh, very good results. But the thing is, there is some uh, approximation that I will be talking about. And the interval estimation is is based on the other pillar of probability or statistics uh, theory. Okay. So you can say that so probability and statistics has two pillars. One is this large large number, another one is this central unit. So the interval estimation technique is based on uh, central limit theorem. Which says that you have some uh, you know n samples from any distribution, they may follow any distribution, but you have to have IAD. Okay, so like uh, so the samples should have been drawn independent of each other. Okay, so that is the important thing. You understand why it has to be independent, right? If I so if I plot up the data, then you know you can't do anything, right? The that so so that that is why you know we have to get uh, two data and it has to be sampled uh, properly, right? So then this uh, sum okay, this sum uh, the distribution of this sum is approximately normal, the bell shaped curve, right? So that is why we say right if you you take a mass distribution of a class and you plot, you will get a bell shaped curve, right? So these are actually, uh, you know, these are uh, consequences of this central limit theorem. So, for example, uh, instead of uh, sum, if you take uh, the mean, so you have the end, then this is normal, mu, variance, sigma square by d. And uh, if you normalize the square root of n, then you get the standard normal. Okay. So this is the central limit theorem. So I thought I will. Uh, how many of you know this Galton board? We heard of. Then I will show this. Okay, this is something interesting. Okay. If you so that actually clearly uh, explains. Uh, uh, Just observe. So, hope I have understood. So, this explains the uh, central limit theorem. So, for example, actually, so you, you understand how this is. So, the, the beads are connected here. Now, okay. now, they are allowed to fall freely. So this is where I said, you know, the independence is important. Every bead has to be allowed to fall independently. Okay, they should be allowed to take their own path. Okay. So now, see, here, so, okay. Then you get to this medium.
See, for example, what is happening is that uh, so there are about uh, two thousand um, uh, two thousand beams. Okay, so we can think of it as two thousand samples. Okay, so at every point. You know, the wheel is allowed to go uh, left or to the right, okay. meaning you can assume minus one value or plus one. So, again, this can be modeled as the norm minus one or plus one, true or false. That's a thing, right? So, this side of this side, every at every stage, okay. So, here it, it may have taken the left, then after coming here also. It doesn't have any again in that can go to right also. So at every stage it is allowed. So now we allow it to fall freely and uh, we get a well shaped distribution. Okay. So this uh, actually uh, explains central in the theorem. Okay, so the, the thing is, if you the whatever the physical phenomena that we saw, so the, the important thing is being mathematician how to model it perfectly. Perfectly, we have to model the physical situation. Okay, so if you perfectly model, so like uh, every weird is like uh, taking values plus one or minus. So what is happening is So what we are finally witnessing is the sum. Okay. The, the sum is actually a binomial random variable. It actually varies from minus ten to plus ten. Okay. If the bead took Every time minus one, minus one, minus one, okay, it will put always the left, 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 then it will come to minus. If it uh, takes all the, uh, you know, uh, plus one, plus one, etc., it will come to minus. Okay, so you can think about it. So, how really is going to happen? And a good example, okay, sorry, how really mathematically I want to know what is actually. Uh, okay, so in the internal estimation uh, thing, the thing is the one uh, thing about in the uh, theorem is that it is only about the resulting distribution is not exactly the uh, domain or the relative the curve. It is very close to the value shape of the curve. Again, if you want it, that is the value shape of the curve. What do you mean? We need, it has to do this thing. We need invariant in the answer. Okay, what do you mean? We get the value shape of the curve. So that's what that is. So that is what we are doing. Since we are doing the majority of time. Numbers, we can get what the cross is. So the same uh, thing, you know, same uh, kind of uh, estimate can be applied to you in general limit So by approximating this uh, sample mean by the normal uh, uh, normal random variable, you can get that to be at least this. So this Z alpha is modified out. Maybe that is those teaching probability and statistics. Right? What is this jump up? Is that the uh, uh, value? Right? In the, you know? So after the uh, jump up, I can in the rest of the topic, the alpha value is more What is that value? That is the value. So for example, the same thing. So this is the same thing that we need 9,604 samples. 
Uh, the problem is uh, this design has to be used with the cost. Whereas all other uh, inequalities, they are all perfect inequalities. There is no approximation. The problem is there. This is approximately equal to the sum. This probability. Whereas in those inequalities, they are all exact. No greater than or equal to the exact. The probability is not exact. But here we use. Central limit theorem to approximate in this case. So that is why. Uh, but in practice, this is what is applied. So this is applied and uh, the mean cross after is in uh, okay. okay. So another theory of this on this term is that in terms it's not defined on the population in class. It is the complement of the Population. So, for example, um, what is the population size of, say, Pakistan? It is about 23 crores. Okay. So, if you know, if you uh, if you need only 10,000 10, samples to predict the DPR for, you know, for the country, Pakistan, then uh, for us, okay. Our population is about 140 crores. Right? So, 140 is about seven times right? the Pakistan. So, the interesting thing is if uh, 10,000 samples are sufficient to predict the figure of the Pakistan, the same number of samples are sufficient for us. So it doesn't depend on the population size. Okay. So this is this is an interesting uh, thing that maybe this might have been so uh, that is very and you know opinion polls also you know, we may have seen it, right? People will predict uh, which which party is your know, Come to power, etc. Like they predict, they are very sure about it. Even there, also, you know, this kind of techniques are used so that it doesn't depend on the population size. Okay. So, people say that just 20,000 samples, how do you predict the election results? If you could come into the election channel, most of the times, what are they predict are going to be in you know, all of us because it is the same. Uh, right? They are not, never 100% sure. Okay. So, most of the time, the enemy is going to happen because, and the people, the Indian enemies, are going to be all happening. This is just a small amount of Okay. Uh, to how many people to ask for PPD? Okay. So, the sample sizes are going to be only 20,000 or so. This is just a 20,000 sample, not technically the residual results, etc. The beauty is this actually. Because uh, you, you can apply that to just two parties. So one party is like zero, another party is one. Zero. It is all is just the binomial energy. All of probability and statistics is uh, the family we call the binomial energy. The simplest one, that is the most interesting one. For many of our practical purposes, that is. That is good enough. Okay, so let me move on. So I got okay. So in this uh, connection, uh, which I might have covered what I want to cover. So there is one more uh, thing that I want because we have to have time. So that is like generating random numbers. Okay. Generating how do we generate random numbers according to some probability? So you may have used uh, some of us to generate random numbers, right? right? So suppose now, now we we have to uh, we have to generate random numbers according to this law. Okay, that means uh, that is the, the possible values are x one, x two, x three, etc. So uh, according to that, according to the law, uh, x1 should come with this much proportion, p1. 
the X2 or propose in P2. In, okay, ideally, I want to generate data so that proposal of X1 is P1 eventually okay, as an interest in the okay. But uh, if you imagine that there is a change in analysis, you may not see that. But ideally, I want to generate the data uh, so that uh, X1 appears with the P1 plans and so on. So, okay, so here is an algorithm. So what uh, so what it is saying is that you generate a uniform random number. So if you think that now it will be one, then we declare it as a uniform. So if you are uniform random number, so uniform between zero and one. If it is between P1 and uh, P1 plus P2, then declare it as X2. If it is between, so I can show this with the uh, So this can be explained with the complexity here. So what you need to do is you just have to, you know, uh, so this is a result here. This one is saying that you just need to know how to generate a uniform random zero one. Okay. If you if you can generate a uniform zero one random number, then you can generate random numbers according to any norm. So what you need to do is generate uniform uh, zero one. So if it is uniform zero one, it is going to lie in one of these zeros, right? So either here, it will lie, or here, or here, or here, or here, right? So if it lies in this interval, you declare it as x one. If it lies here, you declare it as x one, and so on. Okay, so this is the uh, okay. So so the idea is the proof why this algorithm works. Okay, because uh, it forms kind of have to have this property. So what do you call it? You form by A and B is B and B. Okay. Okay. So yeah, you want to get into this okay, this is also the this is called a field inverse transform method. So, so there are some cases. And uh, so from this, how you can generate your binomial variables, how you can generate your binomial random variables, etc. Okay, so this is a uh, peculiar thing is what is going on. In the discrete case, you will uh, you will see you will generate u and you see where it uh, lies, and you will get it as xk or xk plus one according. So the same idea is extended in the So in the general, uh, in the continuous case, the goal is to generate a uh, uh, So the same idea is applied. You generate a uniform in O1 and you declare it as a free noise of P. So essentially, what we were doing is the inverse transform. Then, if you calculate this probability, so you will have given an access to this. So, probability of this is going to be the probability of this, and the probability of this is the same as the probability of this, and then the probability of But uh, since you use uniform, this probability is not going to be a problem. That is why, so the distribution of x is, so this is the distribution of x is the same as it. Yeah. And that is what we wanted. So what it is saying to this is the here is a very simple technique. What I wanted to tell is that so there is a uh, very simple technique. Okay. So the simple technique is that there is a time. You need to be clear. So you just generate you and declare to X as X is not perfect. Okay, so why because the proof is this very simple proof. So you so what is so the model of the story is that if you know how to generate a uniform 
random number, then you can generate any random for any that is the model of this. So it so looks like the by standards. So since I covered the many things, because they don't want to put in anybody but uh, too many times, I know that. I want like that one, you can't cover everything. Hope uh, you got the water something. Okay, so that you can use. If you have persistent keys, feel free to ask. On behalf of Rajiv School of Engineering and Technology, Peter, and all the participants of ICMR CTS, I extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Ashok Kumar for sharing his valuable thoughts with us. Once again, thank you, sir. Friends, kindly now link for the feedback forms available on the chat box and we fill the forms. I would like to give you all notice that we will take for the men and shall meet again at 1.30 p.m. for the invited talk. Thank you.